Jesus came to town, he always stirred things up. He's been stirring up things in here for two weeks in a row now. He never went to a town where controversy did not get started. He was either loved or hated. There was no gray area with Jesus and it still ain't today. In Luke chapter 4, at the very beginning of his ministry, when he just got started, it said he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. That's where his hometown was. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the scroll, he found the place where it was written. And this is what he said, and this is what our church's mission statement, if you will, has been since its start. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised. That's the gospel, folks. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister. And he sat down and all the eyes of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he told them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And they all bear him witness and they wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of their mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? And he told them, you will surely say to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. And he said, truly I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. And, and all they in the synagogues, when they heard these things, they were filled with wrath. And they rose up and they thrust him out of the city. And they led him unto the brow of the hill where the city was built, that they might throw him off of it. But he passing through the midst of them went his way. The people of his own town wanted to kill him for preaching the gospel. He told the truth. Jesus was a miracle man. He was God on earth and he could do anything in the way of a miracle when he came to town. And I'll give you another example. In John chapter two, the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to come to the wedding. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine. And Jesus said, woman, what have I to do with you? My hour is not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, whatever he says, you do it. And there were set six water pots of stone and the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. That's 18 to 27 gallons. And Jesus said unto them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, draw out now and bear it unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he knew not whence it was. But the servants knew. And the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But you have kept the good until now. But you know this? Even after Christ ascended up to heaven, he is still doing miracles for all who will welcome him. And I'm here to tell you even greater miracles than what they saw. Let me give you an example. A young man with a wife and kids was nothing but a drunk. He could never give it up and it hurt his family. And they did without and they were neglected day after day until Jesus came and that young man got saved. 
Well, you know how people are. And many of y'all have had to deal with they laugh at you when you told them you got saved because they remember you the way you used to be. And they figure there's no good ever going to come of this. He or she is faking it. They couldn't possibly real. There is nothing that could turn you around. I know you hear it. And I know some people will probably come to see you out of disbelief to see if you've really changed. And they, they laugh and mock and, they, and when you tell people what Jesus did for you. And the young man was no exception. Somebody came up to him and said, you really believe that Bible? You hear that too? And he said, yes, I do. You mean you believe that Jesus turned the water into wine? He said, yes, I do. And Jesus did an even bigger miracle for me. He turned my wine into milk for my children. <laughs> Jesus broke all the man-made rules that Judaism had set up. And he probably wouldn't be welcome in most of our churches today. If he were to come in here and walk in here, I pray that he would be welcome and that he would be worshipped. But I know a lot of churches, and I've been in them too, and I used to joke that I've been thrown out of the finest churches in Lynchburg. That if he were to walk in some churches, they would not have a place for him at all. Either they'd make him sit in the far back, or they'd probably make him stand guard with Jordan and Jim back there. But he broke all the rules that man had made that they wanted to see done. You see, people today still try to put God in a little box and he's only allowed to do this and he's only allowed to do that and if he steps out of that box and they don't believe it because nobody likes to believe in the miracles and nobody likes to believe in the supernatural anymore. And then Jesus, though, he showed them that he made the rules. In John 4, then he comes to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. And so Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. It was 12 noon. And there came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me to drink. No, 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 Jesus. You don't know what you're doing. You're not supposed to do that. We got rules and regulations against that. You're not supposed to talk to those people. The Samaritans were hated. They are trash. They are unholy. And on top of that, that woman must really be trash because she waited for the other women to leave before she came to the well because the women used to always come together and this woman was so bad that she came by herself because she was ashamed for even the other women to see her. And here Jesus is sitting on the well and asking her to give him something to drink. He broke every rule there was. If he went in the average church today after he got done saying what he had to say they'd be fanning half the people trying to get them conscious again then Jesus told that woman all about her sins he told her that he knew she had had five husbands and was now shacking up with another man and then instead of condemning her he forgave her and he told her how to get eternal life. And he offered her eternal life. He offered her forgiveness. And then she went into the city and grabbed everybody she could. And she says, come see a man that told me all the things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Anybody that would know that? And many people were saved. Because he took the time to talk to a sinner. He took the time to talk to somebody that nobody wanted, that nobody had anything to do with. You know it's bad when the sinners don't want nothing to do with you. That's bad. And this woman, without being condemned, she accepted the Lord. And, and no doubt her life was completely turned around. 
And she got everybody she could. And she says, come see this man. In John chapter 5, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And now at Jerusalem, there was uh, uh, at, by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. And in around that pool, on the outside of that pool, it said lay a multitude of impotent folk, a blind halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. All of these people were taken there by their families and dumped beside that pool in hopes that there would be a chance of them getting healed. And they said, for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and he stirred or troubled the water and whosoever then after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. I pray that Jesus will come and trouble the water in here today. Amen. Stir it up. And a certain man was there which had had an infirmity for 38 years. Can you imagine laying there day after day for 38 years and you had nobody that could come and help you? 38 years. You ever felt that way? Any of y'all ever felt that you've had this problem that you've got for years and years and there has never been any help, there's never been any change? How long have you been in your affliction? How long have you been in your sin? How long have you been, and let's just be honest, in your addiction? I want you to understand this, it don't matter to Jesus. He doesn't care what your past is. When Jesus saw him lying there, and he knew he'd been there a long time in that case. He said to him, will you be made whole? And the impotent man answered and said, sir, I have no man. When the water is troubled to put me in the pool. But while I'm coming, another step it down before me. Jesus didn't beat around the bush. He just looked at him and said, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And it's, the Bible says immediately that man was made whole and he took up his bed and he walked and the same day he did that was on the Sabbath. When everybody was doing their thing and, and obeying their rules and regulations, Jesus went up to a crippled man and said, get up and take your bed and walk away from this. Can Jesus still do that? Oh yeah. As a Christian, we have to start trusting and believing in him more. So many times you're given a prognosis that the world says you won't make it, you're not gonna live, we can't fix it. And I know a bunch of y'all in here, I'm looking at this morning that you heard that, but Jesus said, oh yes, I can fix it. And he did. He certainly did. We've got to start trusting him more. Can you imagine the people that saw what happened? You know there were a lot of the average folks, man, they were praising God and they were jumping up and down when they saw this guy uh, that, that they knew had been there for 38 years and he couldn't walk and all of a sudden he got up and there was strength in his legs and he picked his bed up and walked away. I'm going to tell you something, revival broke out at the pool of Bethesda that day. But the old phony religious leaders, because it won't done their way and under their authority and under their direction, they didn't care about a miracle and they don't care now. There are people, as long as it's done in order, the way they have it. And if it's not... How many times have we had to throw our bulletin aside and just say, all right, Lord, what do you want to do? Praise God. They, these religious leaders wanted the attention on them and for you to stick to their man-made rules. Listen to what happened in verse 10. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, it's a Sabbath day. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. Well, you know what? Who cares? God is the God of the Sabbath. Right. He makes the rules. And if he tells you to get up and walk 
on a day you're not supposed to carry anything. I think I'd listen to him before I'd listen to the Pharisees and the rest of the bunch. Listen, folks, when you need a miracle, you call on Jesus. That's who you need to talk to. He doesn't care what day it is. You don't have to wait to Sunday. How about that? He doesn't care where you are. He doesn't care who you are. He don't care what you are. He is able, people. Please understand, he is able. And you just have to ask him. When Jesus came to town, people got healed. When you are in the presence of Jesus, you can be healed. It's not like he's thousands of miles away. He said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm right there in the middle of them. He is with us right now. When you welcome Jesus in, he'll take care of you and you'll never lack. God can take what little you have and make a big deal of it. In John chapter 6 and verse 5, when Jesus lifted up his eyes, he saw a great company come unto him. And he said to Philip, where are we going to buy bread that these may eat? And he said that to prove him, for he already knew what he was going to do. And Philip answered and said, 200 pennies worth of bread, that's 200 days wages. It's not sufficient for them that everyone can take a little. But here was the exercise of a tiny bit of faith. You don't have to have a whole lot. You just use a little of it. One of the disciples named Andrew, Simon Peter's brother said, there is a little boy here who has five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? But at least he offered it. This little boy's lunch consisted of five little barley biscuits. Barley was the cheap stuff. It was the cha-ching brand, if you will. Most of y'all know what that is if you've been in food line. It wasn't even the wheat bread, it was the barley bread, and that's what the poor people ate. Little biscuits and two very small fish, not even enough for a man to make a meal. But it doesn't make any difference what little you have. The Lord knows how to fix that. Now Jesus said, make the men sit down. And there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in the number of 5,000. Most Bible scholars will agree that the total number was 12,000 because the men were the only ones counted and their wives and children were with them that day. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. You give thanks for what you have, and God will stretch it for you. If what you have is being used for his glory, it will never run out, people. I'm telling you, it will never run out. When they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. And therefore they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remain over and above unto them that had eaten. When Jesus comes into your life, he will bless what you do have and there will be something left over. Jesus could walk on the water he could heal the blind. He could heal the lame. He could cast out devils and raise the dead. When Jesus came to town, you knew he had been there. My, one of my very favorite verses in the entire New Testament it, it, it was the disciples were talking and it said when they looked upon them, they perceived that they knew that they were unlearned and ignorant men, but they had taken note that these men had been with Jesus. That makes the difference. Your education don't make any difference. Your wealth don't make any difference. If you've been with Jesus, people will know it. They'll know it. We'll close out the verses by looking at John chapter 11 for just a few moments. There was a certain man 
that was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him and said, Lord, behold, whom you loveth is sick. And when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified therefore. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And when he had heard that he was sick, he still stayed two days in the same place where he was. And after that, he said to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. And they said, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone you, and you're going to go back? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbles, because there's no light in him. These things said he, after, uh, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. And they said, Well, Lord, if he's asleep, he's doing well. And then Jesus spoke uh, Howbeit Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he had spoken of taking rest and sleep. And then he finally plainly said, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent that you may believe. Nevertheless, let's go unto him. And then Thomas, which is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. They thought Jesus was going to get killed when he went to Jerusalem. They did not realize who they were walking with. And so when Jesus came to Bethany, he found that Lazarus had laid in the grave for four days already. You've got to understand in that climate, four days is a long time to be dead. There's not a whole lot left of you after that. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off, and many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, whatever you ask of God, God will give it to you. Jesus told her, your brother shall rise again. And I want you to understand that no matter whether you pass away in this body right here, if you know Jesus, you will rise again. It don't make any difference where they put you. An old preacher's wife passed away. And at the funeral, somebody told him, said, Brother, so-and-so, I'm sorry you lost your wife. He said, Oh, no, I didn't lose her. I know exactly where she is. Yes. Jesus gives us a promise of resurrection. And next Sunday, we're going to celebrate that time. Today is his triumphal entry. Next Sunday is his resurrection. And because he gives us this promise of a resurrection, you will live again. Martha said, I know that he shall rise in the resurrection at the last day. And then Jesus told her this, and he's telling you this, and he's telling me this. He said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Yep. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, Yet shall he live. Amen. We're not people that have no hope. We are the only ones that do have hope. When we stand over the grave of one of our loved ones that knew Jesus, we have the hope and we have the comfort of knowing that that's not forever. We will meet again. Jesus said, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And then he asked her, do you believe this? That's the key thing. Do you believe that? And she said, yes, Lord, I believe you're the Christ, the Son of God that should come into the world. 
And when she had so said, she went her way and she called Mary, her sister, secretly saying, The master is coming. He's calling for you. And as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet coming to the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. And the Jews that were with her in the house comforted her. And when they saw Mary, they, that she rose up hastily and went out, they followed. And they said, she's going to the grave to weep there. And then when Mary was come to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother had not died. I want you also to understand that Jesus is not without feeling. We have a high priest that has felt everything that we are feeling even now. I don't care what your problem is. I don't care what you're going through. He understands it and he's been there. And he knows. And Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping. He groaned with in the spirit and he was troubled and he said where have you laid him and they said Lord come and see and Jesus wept he wept for a number of reasons I believe one was he sympathized with all of those that had lost a loved one Jesus was no stranger to death his death was approaching in just a few days and plus the fact that Jesus knew he was going to have to bring Lazarus back and put him back in this world again. And that probably was the toughest thing of all. I've had loved ones that have gone on that were so sick when they died. That I'll be honest, I wouldn't bring them back into this world in the condition that they were in. Because they're happy now. They're with him. And so Jesus wept, no doubt, for a number of reasons. But I want you to understand he's felt everything that you have felt and that you're going to feel. And then the Jews said, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused this man that he would not have died? And Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the grave. And it was a cave and a stone lay upon it. And if you are ever to realize the power of God in your life, you're going to have to get rid of that stone off of you. The stone that's keeping everything else out and the hardness of your heart, that stone's going to have to be moved and you are going to have to be revealed in all of whatever it is you have before God. Jesus said, take away the stone. And then Martha, here, here we get back in the flesh again. The sister of him said, Lord, by now he stinks, for he hath been dead four days. And there are some of you maybe sitting in here that your sin has been so great over the years that you think it stinks too. And said, no, God cannot do anything for me. I'm too far gone. No, you are not. If you're sitting in here this morning, if you're watching by TV or listening by radio, I want you to understand you are not too far.